a very good evening everyone myself g arunagiri from government medical college tiruvallu i'll be hosting this session today i will heartily welcome our arteral star faculty dr prasanna kartik sir and our presenter for today's session is dr karan ma'am i request dr v s hariharan sir chairman of ima gdn to grace this occasion over to you sir so good evening so yet another academic evening that we are having before your exam and uh, we have a very eminent uh, faculty and an examiner who loves teaching we have dr prasanna kartik who graduated from madras medical college uh, he did his md in madras medical college and he is uh, one of my close friends i think uh, it will be a very useful session over to you prasanna you muted sir sorry thank you yeah. dr aryan sir uh, it's a pleasure to join you all guys uh, so without fur further ado we will go on to the discussion of this case of respiratory system so karen please take over Dr. Karen, I think you are muted. Sir, am I audible, yes. sir? Yes, you are audible. Please proceed. Ah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today we are going to discuss respiratory system uh, i have taken a case of pleural effusion a 40 year old male mr kishore residing at kelambakam who is a farmer by occupation came to the opd with chief complaints of cough for 10 days breathlessness for 7 days chest pain for 7 days history of presenting illness the patient was apparently normal before 10 days after which he developed cough which was insidious in onset progressive in nature and non productive breathlessness for the past 7 days uh, grade 3 dyspnea according to mmrc grading which was insidious in onset progressive aggravated on exertion and relieved by rest right sided chest pain for the for the past 7 days pleuritic in nature increasing uh, with deep inspiration aggravated by coughing and relieved by lying on right side no history of fever and night sweats no history of uh, swelling on the lower limbs no history of reduced urine outputs no use uh, no history of palpitations orthopnea and pnb past history uh, no similar episodes in the past uh, the patient is a known case of tuberculosis and he is on irregular medications no history of asthma epilepsy diabetes mellitus or systemic hypertension family history no similar uh, illness in the family personal history the patient was a smoker and alcoholic but stopped stopped smoking and alcohol consumption 7 years ago he consumes mixed diet uh, he has normal bowel and bladder habits normal sleep wake cycle but disturbed for the past 10 days due to cough case summary mr kishore a 40 year old residing at kelambakam presented with complaints of cough for 10 days associated with breathlessness and right sided pleuritic type of chest pain This is probably a case of respiratory pathology. Hence, I would like to examine the respiratory system. Okay, Karan, General, like, one minute. Yes. One minute. Yes. Okay. Uh, since you are going to present on a page for for learning, so we will go back to your history. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you have a patient who has come to you with cough for ten days, breathlessness for seven, chest seven days, and chest pain for seven days. so what do you think is the cause for these things you need to make a provisional diagnosis at the end of your summary so what is yes. your provisional diagnosis uh sir some respiratory pathology uh, sir uh, what respiratory pathology are you looking at uh since chest pain is there uh uh i have taken uh, the diagnosis might be uh, probably due to pleural effusion okay no 
the first important thing you need to understand is when you have multiple symptoms in a patient, you put all of them together to make a diagnosis and not a single finding to make a diagnosis. So if you look at respiratory diseases, you can classify respiratory diseases into three parts. Okay, You can look at airway diseases, you can look at parenchymal diseases and you can look at pleural diseases. Now, what makes you certain that it is only pleural disease and not a parenchymal disease? Uh, so, the cough has started first and okay. the breathlessness is there for one week. So, no. Can you go to the next slide? Can you go to the next yeah. slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, since breathlessness is for one week, uh, uh, pleural effusion uh, is one of the causes, sir. Um, Okay. And, uh, okay. Okay. Why not a pneumothorax? Sir, pneumothorax uh, dyspnea will occur in few minutes, sir. Okay. If it is an acute onset of pneumothorax where the lung is being compressed rapidly, the breathlessness would be very fast. But if it's okay. something which is slowly accumulating over a period of few days, again the breathlessness will take some more time to come. Some of your friends have also pointed out another clue which says the cough is non-productive in nature. Yes, sir. Right? Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So, when you go to symptom analysis, the history of presenting illness needs to be a little more elaborate. Okay? Yes. So, you said cough is insidious in onset. What does insidious onset mean? Sir, it was developing over a few days, sir. Uh, it started before 10 days, but uh, uh, in these 10 days, it was uh, uh, aggravating. That is progressive in nature. What is insidious in onset? Okay, the word insidious, when you describe, it is something which is gradual in onset. That means you are not sure when it began. Okay. Yes. If you can remember, you cannot remember the exact date at which it began, you start talking about an insidious in onset. Okay. Yes. And when you say uh, acute in onset or sudden in onset, you are able to pinpoint a particular date and time at which the breathlessness or the symptom particularly started. Right. So you need to make sure that it is there. And when you talk about cough, which is insidious in onset and progressive in nature, what about variation of cough with posture with the diurnal variation? Is there any other variation of cough? Uh, sir, uh, uh, the, uh, there's no uh, diurnal variation, sir. But uh, okay. if the patient is uh, um, sleeping in its in his uh, normal side, the cough is reducing. Okay. So, the cough is relieved when he lies on the normal no. side, which is the left yes. side. Yes, sir. Okay. Fine. Accepted. So, all of those needs to be presented in your history of presenting illness. Yes. Okay. Somebody asks again, what is insidious? Insidious in onset means it's slowly progressing. Sorry. The onset is so gradual that you are not able to pinpoint a particular time at which it began. Okay. So, moving on to the second symptom, which is breathlessness. Okay. You said breathlessness is greatly dyspnea. Again, insidious in onset and progressive. What did it progress from? Grade 2 to grade 3 or grade 1 to grade 3? The grade 2 to grade 3, sir. Okay. Somebody who is apparently normal in one week back suddenly develops grade 2 dyspnea. It's something which is going to be quite sudden in onset. You can't think about it as an insidious in onset. If you talk about insidious in onset, then the disease has been slowly progressive for at least a few weeks or a few months. So, yes. I would reconsider the breathlessness, especially grade 2 dyspnea is something the patient should be made aware about earlier. So, he might have to understand it as a acute onset and not as insidious in onset. Okay. What about other symptoms? Uh, sir, uh, yes. Is there a history of wheezing? No, sir. Where did you mention it? 
I didn't mention, sir. Okay. Does he have history of hemoptysis? No, sir. Okay. Now, all of these are additional questions that you need to make sure that you ask the patient. Okay. So, when yes, you are sir. talking on history of presenting illness, it needs to be elaborate in the first sense that you elaborate all the presenting complaints the patient has. Then you talk about relevant respiratory symptoms the patient may have or may not have. And then you ask about other symptoms which the patient may have with the, because of the other system involvement. Okay. Since you asked for swelling of lower limbs and reduced urine output, why did you not look at abdominal distension also? Okay. So what are you ruling out by looking at a lower limb swelling, reduced urine output or abdominal distension? Sir, uh, right heart failure, sir. Okay, you are looking at right heart failure or left heart failure. Can a patient have a cardiovascular disease and have a pleural effusion secondary to this? Yes, sir. He might have, sir. Uh, a patient hmm. with uh, heart failure may have pleural effusion, sir, because of the uh, 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 right. You are right. Yes, you are right. So, how did you rule out a cardiac disease with this history? Sir, I asked for lower limb swelling uh, okay. and uh, he didn't have any oligurea also. Yeah, accepted. Uh, PND also was not there. Yeah. Okay, what are the symptoms? Can you ask? Palpitations, hmm. sir. Okay, you've asked for palpitations, you've asked for autopsia, you've asked for PND. The other cardinal symptom in respirate, uh, cardiovascular is syncope. Correct? Yes. You've asked this. Right. Yes. What prevents this patient from having a liver disease? Can a liver disease present you with right pleural effusion? Yes, sir. Um, yes. So, yeah. uh, the patient didn't have any uh, abdominal distension or uh, he right. didn't have any jaundice history, ascites. So, it's not liver pathology. So, you have not told me whether the patient has any history of yellow exploration of eyes, mucous membrane or urine. You have not told me whether the patient has any abdominal distension or not. And you have not told me whether the patient has any other abdominal symptoms. Correct? Yes, sir. So, when you are presenting the history, you are not sure what system you have. Okay, In a long case presentation, the system comes after you make your summary. So don't start by saying this patient has only respiratory disease. If you start saying that, then you will not think about other causes of the problem in the patient. Okay. So yes. have a broad differential and then narrow down as you go ahead. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yes. Sir. Okay. This is what happens usually in the exam. When you start presenting, you know it is respiratory because somebody told you it's a case of right sided pleural effusion. You do not think about other things. And when the examiner asks you, he doesn't have an idea about what the case is. He's just listening to what you're presenting. And then when I start hearing right-sided pleural effusion, I will start thinking, is it cardiac? Is it renal? Is it abdominal? Uh, is it liver? Or things like that. So you need to be sure about what you are presenting. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay. If you say known case of tuberculosis, when was he diagnosed? Yes, sir. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, uh, two months back, sir, but on irregular medications. Sir. What do you mean by irregular medications? And uh, what medications? Uh, he's, he's on first uh, category one uh, anti-tubercular drugs, but uh, uh, he's not taking it daily and on and off he's taking, sir. That's irregular medication, what I meant. Okay, he's non-compliant to medications. Yes. Okay. Accepted. Somebody asked a question about coarseness of voice. Okay, if you want to ask about coarseness of voice, upper respiratory tract symptoms, you are welcome to ask. But at least minimum of these symptoms which we had discussed, I would expect. If you don't mention it also, it's fine. I don't have a problem. Okay? Right. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay. You said patient was a smoker and a alcoholic. Okay. He stopped. When did he start and how long was he smoking and drinking? Um, sir, he stop, uh, stopped 
smoking an alcohol seven years ago. Uh, he is now forty years, sir. But he started at the age of thirty or thirty-one, sir. Why is it important? Um, uh, sir. Um, uh, this uh, smoking and alcohol, we might think in case uh, the patient might have uh, COPD or uh, they might have uh, such diseases also, sir, in respiratory pathology. So, uh, smoking history is important. Okay, let me give you a scenario. Say, for example, the patient is 65 years old and he tells you he was a smoker and stopped seven years back. Yes. Okay, so. Is it only COPD that you are worried about? Is it something else also you can think about? COPD, bronchial asthma, sir. Uh, okay. uh, I can even think of uh, bronchogenic carcinoma, sir. Okay. So you need to know the duration of smoking the patient had so that you can start thinking about bronchogenic CAS possibility, right? So you yes. need to consider that also. So when you are presenting the personal history, if the patient is a smoker and an alcoholic, you need to say, when did they start? When did he stop? How much has he smoked? Okay, you need to quantify the amount of smoking. Somebody wants to talk about the smoking index or the pack index in the pack years. Fine, use that to quantify the amount of smoking that he has done. Same way, when somebody you say is consumed alcohol, you need to quantify for how long has he been drinking. He could have just had alcohol for two months and then stopped. It probably wouldn't have even caused any changes in him. But he could have started at 18 years and consumed alcohol for 20 years and stopped 7 years back. It might make a difference to your diagnosis. Correct? So, please yes. be careful about that. Okay? Yes. Right. Go on to your next slide. Okay. Now, how did you arrive at it being a respiratory pathology and what is your provisional diagnosis? Uh, sir, um... The patient had uh, complaints of cough, breathlessness, and chest pain, sir. Uh, so, yeah. uh, um, probably case of respiratory pathology, sir. Okay. Why not a cardiovascular pathology? Sir, the uh, type of chest pain is pleuritic type, sir. So... We had a discussion a little earlier saying that this patient could have a cardiovascular disease. Along with that, patient could have a pleural effusion. Some of your friends are also commenting on other causes of why this is great. Way. We have not ruled out other causes. We still don't know. Okay. There's a positive history of tuberculosis, which you have not mentioned in your summary. Yes. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, just because somebody does not have orthopnea or PND, I am not going to say patient has no heart failure. There is something called acute heart failure which can happen short term. So that can also present you with right-sided pleural effusion. Okay. So, fine. Accepting it's a respiratory disease. Okay. Most of you have answered correctly. Right. Among respiratory disease, what do you think is the disease? Uh, plural effusion, sir. Uh, okay. Right sided plural effusion. Again, very difficult to say only from the history that it is plural effusion. You can only say it's a plural disease. Yes, sir. Okay, because the patient has a dry cough, breathlessness, pleuritic chest pain, I would say this patient has probably a plural disease. Somebody yes. wants to add an interstitial lung disease. I will accept an interstitial lung disease also, but the difference here being. Breathlessness would not be of such short duration. Okay, An interstitial lung disease is a progressive breathlessness which is insidious and onset of a longer duration of symptoms. Won't be for such a short time. Okay, So I would not consider interstitial lung disease in this patient. And I am not going to consider a parenchymal disease in this patient. Probably because the patient has no productive expectation. But Something is against the possibility. Okay, something can also favor an underlying uh, parenchymal disease in this symptom, which is malignancy. No, 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 no. What symptom can favor an underlying parenchymal lung disease? No. 
which are these symptoms which you have said no breathlessness and pleuritic type of chest pain can also favor an underlying parenchymal disease sir cough sir um more likely i would think of a pleuritic chest pain okay if somebody has a pleuritic chest pain i would consider the possibility of an underlying parenchymal disease also okay yes sir right uh, most of your friends are answering and asking me questions probably questions we will answer at the end of the class the answers i read out and if it's okay i accept it okay so for people who are putting it on the chat box questions we will try to take it at the last okay i am not able to answer all your questions because it's going up very fast right so we'll move on to the next part of the presentation if that's fine if there are no yes. more further doubts from your side yes sir okay a uh, general examination the patient is conscious oriented to person place and time thinly built and poorly nourished mild pallor present no ictus no cyanosis no clubbing no lymphadenopathy no edema okay just stop previous slide what is mild pallor what is moderate pallor what is severe pallor am i audible yes sir yes sir hmm. so in this presentation i would be happy if you said pallor is present okay yes. so as somebody says it cannot be quantified which i whole heartedly accept so you need to say whether pallor is present or not uh, no pallor seen only in conjunctiva i am not going to accept as mild i will only say pallor is present or absent okay so yes. what are the respiratory causes of ictus okay your friends have started answering correctly pneumonia sir uh, okay accepted and some drugs sir uh drugs pulmonary infarction sir ఒకేక్టెడ్ i am not sure how empyema is going to produce stress okay somebody says cystic fibrosis with bronchiectasis tuberculosis therapy accepted fine red hepatization stage of pneumonia okay fine so when you present this cases of uh, general examination in a respiratory or any cardiovascular system or for that matter even neurology remember what are the respiratory causes of ictus and what are the ictus causing diseases with ictus causing respiratory disease so both ways you need to be understood about it okay so yes. if you have seen clubbing in this patient what would you start suspecting sagapadam clubbing pan cost tumor anything else better answer yes bronchogenic carcinoma So you start bronchi- suspecting a bronchiectasis or empyema okay you are talking about a plural disease so let's start with plural diseases for clubbing i'm not asking you the respiratory causes of clubbing in this patient if you found clubbing what other things are you starting to think empyema is not probably a cause of clubbing empyema yes empyema no So if I see clubbing, I am going to start suspecting whether the patient has an underlying malignancy. Need not be malignant pleural effusion; it could be any malignancy also. So that's also a possibility, right? Okay. Yes. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, vitals: pulse rate ninety per minute, regular in rhythm, rate, volume, normal character. All peripheral pulses felt. No radio radial or radio femoral delay. Respiratory rate twenty eight per minute. blood pressure 110 on 70 mm of mercury 
measured in the right upper arm in sitting position. Temperature a febrile. Okay. Why the respiratory rate is only 28 per minute? No further description about it. So the patient is uh, uh, attacking me. No, rate is telling you that. You need to tell us what is the regularity of the respiration. Is it regular or irregular? And whether it is thoracic or abdominal or abdominal thoracic. Okay. So what is this patient having? Abdominal thoracic or thoracic abdominal? Or abdominal thoracic, sir. Okay. Fine. Continue. Uh, systemic examination, examination of the respiratory system, inspection, upper respiratory tract, no deviation of the nasal septum, no polyps or tonsillitis, good oral hygiene, no dental caries, no halitosis, lower respiratory tract, uh, chest is bilaterally symmetrical, elliptical in shape, uh, movements lightly restricted on the right side on respiration, abdominal thoracic type, uh, trachea appears to be shifted to the left. Epical impulse not seen, no supraclavicular or infraclavicular hollowing, uh, no chest deformities and drooping of shoulders. Right intercostal spaces appears to be full, no use of axillary muscles of respiration, no scars, sinuses and dilated veins, no crowding of ribs, no kyphosis or scoliosis. Okay, just a minute. What about JVP? Uh, I didn't check JVP, sir, but JVP is not elevated. Will okay, not... even in a respiratory patient, make sure you do check for elevation of the JVP. And second, make sure you are able to see the waveforms properly. So, yes. JVP can be affected in patients with respiratory disease. Okay, yes. your friends are answering carpal manel. Okay, yes. accepted. Right. What do you mean by the trachea appears to be shifted to the left? What did you make out? Sir? How did you make out the trachea appears to be shifted to the left? Um, okay. Trail sign. Everybody starts saying the trail sign. Did you make out a trail sign? Yes, sir. Uh, the um, turn of leader of mastoid uh, uh, prominent thing, sir. Prominence of the sternal head of the sternal head of mastoid. Okay. Yes. Due to why does it occur? Why is there a trail sign positive? Uh, sir, because uh, on the on the side which trachea has shifted, there will be uh, uh, the um, uh, um, hmm. so the uh, uh, muscles will be relaxed. Sir. So, the trachea is covered by the pretracheal fascia, which is a yes. part of the deep cervical fascia. So, yes. when the trachea deviates to one side, the fascia on that side becomes lax. Yes. Now, the same deep cervical fascia has an investing layer, which is what splits to enclose the sternocleidomastoid. So, what happens when the fascia becomes lax? Normally, when it is taut, it remains like this, flat. So, when it relaxes, it becomes loose. So, the uh, sternocleidomastoid appears to be prominent. Okay? So, that yes. is a trail sign. So, the inspectory finding is a positive trail sign on the left side. So, because of that, you can interpret it as a tracheal deviation yes. to the left. Yes. Yes. Okay? Yes. Right. Okay? Fine. You can move on. Uh, palpation. Inspectory findings were confirmed. Uh, trachea is shifted to the left. Apical impulse felt on the left fifth intercostal space, half an inch medial to the mid-clavicular line. Chest movements. Uh, uh, in the right side, uh, it's decreased. And in the left side, the chest movements are normal. Uh, chest expansion is 4 centimeters. Uh, anterior posterior is to transverse. Diameter is normal, 5 is to 7. No tactile fremitus. Uh, vocal fremitus is de decreased on the right supraclavicular, infraclavicular, mammary, axillary, infraaxillary, suprascapular, interscapular, and infrascapular. Sir. All the regions it's decreased. Sir. Vocal fremitus is normal on the left side. Okay. So, again, coming back to your palpation. Okay, your friends have started asking you questions. What are the measurements? So, what are the measurements you made of? 
sir anterior posterior and transverse diameter sir then uh, a chest x no 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 you don't tell me the ratio you tell me the actual measurements what are the amount you measured Uh, what was the anterior posterior diameter measurement? What was the transverse diameter measurement? And somebody wants to ask you about the hemithorax expansion, hemithorax measurements. So when you start talking mm -hmm. on measurements, before you interpret, see, you have interpreted the chest measurements as an expansion of per centimeter. So first tell us what is the total chest circumference when the patient has a inspiration, full inspiration and full expiration. Then you will know what is the total chest expansion. Then measure the right hemithorax, left hemithorax independently. Again, inspiration, expiration, what is the measurement? So you will also have the contribution of each hemithorax to this 4 centimeters. Probably in this patient, you have 1 centimeter on the right side and 3 centimeters on the left side, which will tell you that the chest is moving less on the right side. Okay? Yes, and when you go to the previous slide, Correct? About chest movements. Again, this amount of areas to be checked are the same as the regular chest areas. Okay? So, it could be supraclavicular, intraclavicular, mammary. Um, then, it would be suprascapular, intrascapular, upper intrascapular and lower intrascapular. So, you need to check more areas because sometimes... Just the anterior, the upper half may be normal, whereas the lower half can be still abnormal, decreased or things like that. So, please mention more number of areas when you talk about the chest movements. Okay? Yes, right? Yes. Okay. You can proceed. Uh, percussion. Uh, so, uh, I percussed all the areas. Uh, on the yeah. right side, uh, uh, it is stony dull. The affected side is stony dull and left side is resonant, uh, but uh, uh, cardiac dullness is felt in the infraclavicular and mammary uh, areas. And uh, slow shifting dullness is also present. Hmm. Continue. That's all? Yes. If you find dullness on the right side, what else should you do? Yes, tidal percussion needs to be checked. Yes, sir. Did you do tidal percussion? Sir? Did you do tidal percussion, Karen? No, sir, I didn't do. Always remember, if you find dullness on the right side, you should know to do tidal percussion. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, Here, the expansive dullness on the right side tells you the pathology is in the lung. Okay? But suppose you had only infraxillary, infrascapular dullness, then probably you need to mention the tidal percussion. Somebody wants to ask you why there is cardiac dullness in the infraclavicular area. Okay. Uh, technically, an infraclavicular area is not supposed to have cardiac dullness. If you say there is cardiac dullness, then you'll have to tell me why it is. So, you want to answer why you have cardiac dullness in the infraclavicular area? Uh, no, sir. That was a mistake, sir. Okay. Sometimes it might happen that if you have a massive effusion on the right side, the mediastinum itself shifts. Okay. So, you might find areas of dullness on the left side also. It may not be because of cardiac. It's just because of the mediastinal structures which are coming outside the sternal borders. So, you can have dullness on the left side. So, if it's a mistake, okay. But sometimes it can also happen. Right. Whenever you find dullness, what are the other things that you should do? Look for? You've looked for shifting dullness, correct? So, what else will you look for? What other S will you look for? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Yes, curve of L is, sir. Sorry? Yes, curve of L is, sir. Okay, uh, Ellis curve is not clinically demonstrable. Okay, it's very difficult to make it out. Okay, you don't talk about an Ellis curve unless you're looking at a chest x ray. What you need to do is if you have dullness, you always look for shifting dullness, straight line dullness, succussion splash, and a kind of sound. 
Yes. Okay, so you have four S's to check for. Did you yes. check? Yes, sir. So where uh, they are present? It's an auscultation. Point sound and power. Okay, they are generally part of percussion. Okay, no? yes. Okay, fine. You have presented it under auscultation. Fine. Somebody wants to talk about drop space, right? Uh, drop space only if I feel there is dullness in the left side. Okay. If since it's resonant, I'm not going to do trap space unless you're thinking of a gastric pathology. Right. Somebody wants the 4S. If you see dullness, look for shifting dullness, straight line dullness, succussion splash, and sound of fine or fine of sound. Okay. 4S. Okay. You can move on. Auscultation. Absent breath sounds on the right side. Normal vesicular breath sounds on the left side. No added sounds. No resonance. Uh, a vocal resonance decreased on the right side. No coin sound post tussive suction and succession splash. When do you look for post tussive suction? Um, yeah, somebody says when you hear when you suspect the cavity. Right. Only when you get a bronchial breath sound, which is cavernous in type, you look for a post tussive suction. You generally don't look for post suction otherwise. Okay, when you present your auscultatory findings, when you say absent breath sound on the right side, again mention the area. Sometimes you might have areas where the breath sounds may be present. For example, the apex, the right, the breath sounds may be present. Right now, you're telling me even the apex on the right side does not have any breath sounds. So it's a quite a huge, massive right effusion. Okay, so please do. Examine for individual areas and you present where the areas are. Okay, so for each area, do present how the breath sounds are. Um, somebody wants to talk about cardiac resonance. I don't understand why it came up. Okay. Um, you look for added sounds. Okay, can you get a bronchial breath sound in a patient with pleural effusion? Yes, sir. Where, sir? Where do you get it? Uh, hmm. So just above the level of effusion, you but may get a small area only we need here, sir. Sorry? In a very small area above the effusion, we might yes, hear broken. Okay, hear it. Okay. Okay, somebody wants to know what this bronchial is. Okay, we will have the discussion a little later. Okay, fine. Vocal resonance is decreased on the right side. Yes, please proceed. Uh, examination of other systems, cardiovascular system. Uh, yes one, yes two heard, no murmurs. Abdomen, soft, non-tender and no organomegaly. Uh, central nervous system, no focal neurological deficit. Uh, diagnosis. Probably a case of right-sided pleural lung disease, most probably pleural effusion of infectious etiology, probably due to tuberculosis. Okay, one minute. Just go back yes. to the diagnosis. Probably a case of... I don't think you have to say probably a case of... You should be convinced about what this case is. Okay. So, a case of right-sided pleural effusion, probably of infectious etiology due to tuberculosis, without any complications. What complications did you look for? One complication you get in a pleural effusion can be? Uh, the pleural effusion, if not treated, it might... Uh, 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 it might lead to a fibrosis, sir. No, everybody seems to be answering. Sempaima, there is a complication that you look for. If there is pus inside the pleural space, so that can sometimes happen. Okay? Right. And you will also have to comment whether the patient has any respiratory failure and whether if it's a long-standing disease, you have to comment on whether the patient has carpal. So, does the patient have a respiratory failure now? No, sir. Uh, How did you rule out? Sir, uh, external manifestation of respiratory failure is 
as check to sir so it was not present in this patient so i ruled out respiratory failure how did you how did i as an examiner know that you checked for aspects you did not present in your general examination you also did not present in neurological examination so please remember to present no aspects somewhere yes. okay yes and in your general examination you had not presented about external markers of tuberculosis external markers of malignancy yeah somebody seems to be raising it right now so please don't forget to mention the external markers yes, correct yes sir so your complete diagnosis would be a case of right sided pleural effusion probably and probably due to tuberculosis with no evident complications okay yes. with probable smoking and alcohol history as a bad okay yes you can move on to the next slide uh investigations a complete blood count blood urea serum creatinine sputum afp blood glucose lipid profile uh, liver function test usg abdomen echo manto test and the pleural fluid analysis so in pleural fluid analysis we will check for glucose wbc uh, ph and ads okay before you go to that why do you want to do a lipid profile in this patient um, sir uh, uh, sir the uh, for fluid uh, pleural fluid analysis uh, uh, we need to know the uh, lgh lactate dehydrogenase level sir lipid profile does not contain lactate dehydrogenase yeah. my question is why do you need a lipid profile age thyrothorax okay somebody wants to talk about thyrothorax even in a thyrothorax patient i am not really worried about abnormalities to the lipid profile okay because the thyrothorax might be sometimes due to just the rupture of the thoracic duct okay somebody wants to talk about exudate okay somebody wants to talk about screening okay i am not sure what you will screen with lipid profile right Okay, sputum AFB is positive or negative in a patient with tuberculous pleural effusion? Uh, sir, sputum AFB will be uh, positive, sir, because so we classify tuberculosis as pulmonary tuberculosis and extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Pleural effusion comes into the category of extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Yes. So, sputum AFB may be negative. Yes. Okay. So, you want to do a pleural fluid analysis. What are the things that you are going to look for in the pleural fluid analysis? Yes. You said glucose. You looked at WBC. You looked at pH. You looked at ADA. What else do you want? Uh, sir, uh, uh, serum protein ratio, sir. Okay, serum uh, protein. You need to look at. Uh, We look to look at LDH. Somebody said adenosine. It's not adenosine. It's adenosine deaminase (ADA). What more can we do? Uh, I wouldn't do for a biopsy or an IGRA. Okay, IGRA is not much use in India. Uh, cytology accepted, malignant cells accepted. Any other test? Rapid diagnostic. Sorry. Any other tests for these patients? Molecular diagnostic tests? Yeah, somebody said CBNAT. Okay, so you can do a CBNAT with the pleural fluid analysis. As okay, so a part of your pleural fluid analysis, make sure to include CBNAT. What does CBNAT stand for? Uh, cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test okay so that is what you are cbnat tells you fine okay now tell me how do you interpret each of these investigations what will you look in a complete blood count uh, sir in complete blood count there will be lymphocytosis sir uh, in early stages there will be uh, neutrophil predominant uh, okay uh, Lymphocytes. Yes. 
then what else in cbc mm -hmm. one more finding okay somebody said raise tsr mm -hmm. and you also wanted to look at the hemoglobin to make sure that this patient does not have anemia what yes. are the causes of anemia and tuberculosis sir uh, hemoptysis sir very good hemoptysis due to Okay, somebody is put it, Rasmussen's aneurysm rupture in a cavity, accepted. Right, then, anemia of chronic disease is very important. So, think of anemia of chronic disease, accepted. What else can also be a pus of anemia? Uh, 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 there will be uh, protein loss due to ex uh, excessive uh, sputum production, sir. Why do you want to do a blood glucose? Okay, somebody tells me correctly that diabetes, tuberculosis are quite closely associated. So if you have diabetes, you're more likely to have tuberculosis. Accepted. All right. Why do you want to do a Mantos test? For, uh, uh, hmm. for tuberculosis, latent okay, TB. You want to for latent tuberculosis. In India, the problem with latent TB is that we can be exposed because of a lot of other reasons and Manto cannot be positive. Okay, somebody said, okay, you have been vaccinated, so it's also a positivity. Any other tests other than those mentioned here that you would like to check? I'm not sure about IGRA. I am In India, I will not definitely talk about IGRA. Okay. If you're living in the West, where the prevalence of tuberculosis is less, accept it. Uh, Somebody said RMN staining. I think it's just a modified version of it. So you can say, yes, finally somebody hits the diagnosis. We want to do a chest x-ray. You've not done a chest x-ray or imaging studies. Is it in the next slide? No, sir. I didn't. You need to image it, right? That is very, very important. More than an USG abdomen, yes. Okay, uh, CT chest. Probably I would recommend after I have tapped the fluid because then it will allow me to visualize the lung better. So you need to do a chest X-ray definitely. So what will you, what will the pleural effusion appear on the chest X-ray? Or what are the findings on a chest X-ray in a patient with pleural effusion? Somebody says meniscus sign, bat wing. Okay. Okay, so fine. You have a homogeneous opacity with obliteration of the costophrenic and costodiaphragmatic angles, and you can also have an LS curve. Okay, homogeneous opacity. Right. Any other investigation? One more. Anybody? Any idea? Uh, no, not biopsy. I'm not looking at biopsy because I don't think of malignancy. I'm not looking at biopsy. Uh, not pulmonary function test, not ultrasound. I don't know if you guys have messaged me earlier, but I'm not sure. So I'm not, I'm just looking at it. Definitely not an MRI. Okay. I don't need an MRI here. No real time pneumocentesis. Uh, BNP, no, I'm not looking at it. Not BAL. Okay. I'm looking at a very basic investigation. It's not related to anything to do with this disease. It's another disease. Just see if it's associated with this patient. Just like diabetes, any other disease. Yeah, somebody finally said HIV testing. Okay, so please do check for HIV co-infection because if you have tuberculosis and HIV co-infection, you need to treat it appropriately. Fine. So these are the basic investigations that you need to do and further depending on your investigations reports, you can do other specific investigations if you want. Okay, so can you have the next slide? 
ட்ரீட்மெண்ட் ப்ளூரல் ஃப்ளூட் ஆஸ்பிரேஷன் என்எஸ்ஏடிஸ் டு ரிலீவ் செஸ்ட் பெயின் பெட் ரெஸ்ட் அண்ட் ப்ராப்பர் நியூட்ரிஷன் அண்ட் கேட்டகரி ஒன் ஆன்டி டியூபர்குலர் ட்ரக்ஸ் டூ டாட்ஸ் ரெஜிமெண்ட் அண்ட் சிக்ஸ் மந்த்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஹெச்ஆர் ரிசரி ரெஜிமெண்ட் You want to give six months of HRZD? Are you sure? I don't think it is correct. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, mm. this patient is, uh, is uh, on and off. He is not uh, properly taking the medicine. So... Then he shouldn't be on category one, right? If you think yes, it's a sir. treatment defaulter, then you should go to category 2. Yes, okay. Sir. Let us assume that he is being treated for the first time. Okay. So, he is going to get category 1. Okay. So, let's see as if you have seen him earlier when you said he had category 1 TV. Still 6 months of 4 drugs. Is that the regime? No, sir. 4 months of 4 mm. drugs and 2 months of 3 drugs. Uh-huh. Four months two of HRs. HRs. Two months of four drugs and four months of three drugs. Okay? Be very yes. clear. Two months, all the four drugs. Eisen has it, Rifampicin, Pyrazinamide and Ethambutol. And next four months, depending on the clearance, probably for this patient not, you will give him three drugs. Eisen has it, Rifampicin and Ethambutol. Okay? What other drugs should you give? what other drug should you give okay everybody says pyridoxine accepted anything else because if you take att nowadays government when you give dots it is already there not okay i am not talking about bedaquiline i am not talking about dalamidate i am ask not definitely not uh, linezolid or streptomycin amyloglycoside this patient has what we call as zero cell tuberculosis that means it involves the zero sub so pleural effusion pericardial effusion or a men uh, tuberculosis meningitis you need to give the patient steroid therapy at least for a short period of time yes, okay so please remember that you need to give a short course of steroids because it will prevent from fibrosis from developing okay yes, so is there any more slides no sir okay right so the last question is what are the side effects of the anti tuberculosis therapy each drug tell me the side effects i want drug specific side effects so if you start with h what is h isoni acid what do you get um uh-huh. um uh-huh. Isoni acid, you get peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy. Okay. Rifampicin, what do you get? Uh, you so get the orange. The patient might get red urine, sir. Orange for discoloration of sweat, urine, any secretion, flu-like uh, syndrome, hepatitis. It what is hepatotoxic, pyra- sir. Yes. Pyrazinamide. Um, okay. Liver disease and... hyperuricemia what about ethambutol sir optic neuritis very good so before you start treatment for this you need to make sure that your lft and your eye color vision is normal for the patient if you are going to put the patient on injectables like streptomycin you also make sure the renal parameters are normal okay yes. clear okay so can we answer clear doubts one at a time i think probably somebody can unmute by by one and ask the questions if they have is that okay or should we close the class they can raise the hands sir i will unmute them okay fine thank you more 6 uh, minutes are the it's enough time for that okay uh, so guys whoever has a doubt please raise your hand so that for host can unmute guys don't post in the chat box it might be a little difficult to answer all the questions right now so if you can unmute and ask i'd be happy to answer 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, you, what are the tumor markers you said? I didn't talk about tumor markers. I had not. I only said external markers of malignancy. I didn't talk about tumor markers. Okay, sir. What are those? What do you mean by what are those? I'm sorry. The external markers of malignancy. Okay. External markers of malignancy, you can talk about hexia. You can look for dilated veins. You can look for a pancreas tumor producing small muscle wasting. Those kind of things can be markers of malignancy. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, that explanation about tracheal deviation, could you please exp explain it once more, sir? Okay. The trachea is covered by the pretracheal fascia, which is a part of the cervical, deep cervical fascia. Now, the deep cervical fascia has got three layers. The investing layer of the deep cervical fascia, the pretracheal fascia and the prevertebral fascia. Now, when the, pre, when the trachea deviates, there is a laxity which produ is produced in the pretracheal fascia and thereby in the investing layer. So, normally, if you look at a muscle, right, the muscle looks like this because the two layers are very tight to each other. So, when it relaxes, it will bulk out. Okay, so the muscle becomes more prominent on the side where there is deviation. This is because of the relaxation of the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. I hope I am clear. The Hoshi has raised the answer. Okay. Anybody else? Sir, uh, when would yeah. we do a HRCT and when would we do a chest X ray? Is there any difference in the indications for them? No, 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 no. See, a chest X ray is a very good tool for looking at a respiratory disease. Okay. Now, if you do a HRCT in a patient with a massive pleural effusion, the CT will not reveal anything about the underlying lung disease on the right side. The left lung will be seen. The left lung is completely covered by fluid. So the radiologist will not be able to make out what is wrong with the lung. Probably there could be a TB cavity. There could be a malignancy sitting there. So if you ask your radiologist to give you a CT report, they will say, go tap the fluid, remove the fluid, and after that, come back and do it so that I can look at the parenchyma and tell you if there's a parenchymal disease on the right side. So, other than that, there is nothing to say you should not do an HRCT for a patient with pleural effusion. You can do it, but it's just going to give you a little less information. But otherwise, both are investigations fine enough for the respiratory system. And the HRCT gives you more information about parenchymal lung diseases. So, if you're looking at pleural mm -hmm. diseases, probably a chest X-ray is enough for me to diagnose. If I look at parenchymal diseases, if I want to look at the extent of a bronchiectasis phasis or an ILD, or a consolidation, probably then I would go ahead and do a HRCT of the chest. Okay. Thank you. I think that everyone's doubt has been clear, sir. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for this amazing session. Thank you, sir. And took your time to clear everyone's doubt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for this participation. Tomorrow, we will have a medicine session on CNS case discussion at 9 p.m. Please note the timing again, 9 p.m. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone.